I'd like to welcome you all to the, to the last in our lecture series of the spring on rural urban connections, um, where we've looked at a number of issues. We've looked at forests, we've looked at energy, we've looked at water, and today we get to talk about food. And speaking of food, uh, if you stick around, there will be pizza later, so courtesy of Hot Lips Pizza, so I encourage you to stay around for that. Uh, my name is Jennifer Allen. I'm the director of Portland State's Institute for Sustainable Solutions. Um, we are Portland State's campus-wide uh, sustainability initiative. We work on educational initiatives, research, and community engagement. And uh, this, is, this lecture series is a great example of the community engagement piece of this as well, because we're lucky to partner with Sustainable Northwest uh, to, to have put this uh, lecture series together. Um, and Patrick Shannon's here from Sustainable Northwest, as well as Renee in the back. And, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, and others, others, I'm sorry, others, we're populated by Sustainable Northwest tonight. Um, they're a terrific organization that has done work uh, with rural communities across uh, the Pacific Northwest for many years, um, really engaging them effectively in problem solving and capacity building. Uh, and they have a wonderful event coming up on August 9th, which is called? Something. Yes, Has, do you hear the beer part, anyway? <laughs> so, and that's gonna be located at their Sustainable Northwest Wood Distribution Center in Southeast Portland. And so there's information over here on the side I encourage you all to attend and donate generously to Sustainable Northwest. Um, so we have left time for questions after the talk, and if you do have questions, please come up to the microphone and use that. Um, that's also important because we're videotaping this event and it will be posted on our website and that way we can make sure we capture your great questions and the wonderful answers I'm sure our panel will be providing. And um, let me see, so actually now I get to turn it over to our moderator, Allison Dennis, uh, who is the Executive Director of Portland State's Center for Global Leadership and Sustainability in our School of Business Administration. And she's also a recognized leader in sustainable business and has experience in the food aspects of sustainable business as well. Um, as she previously served as the Director of Sustainability Programs for Burgerville. So, Allison, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks uh, everyone who pulls this series together. It's a tremendous asset for our university and our community. I'll start right off by introducing our speakers. Who do I have first? <laughs> Corey Kerman was raised on a cattle ranch in Wallawa, Oregon, where her family has lived since 1913. After graduating from Stanford with an environmental policy degree and working on Capitol Hill in Los Angeles, Corey returned to rural Oregon in 2003, realizing that it was up to her to continue the legacy of her family ranch, she began exploring alternative options for raising and marketing their cattle. Today, she and her husband, Dave Flynn, raise registered cattle and market Oregon's first Food Alliance certified grass-fed beef to consumers in area restaurants, hospitals, and universities. In addition to being engaged in multiple ecosystem restoration projects, which I hope you get to hear about, Corey works with local ranchers to explore collective marketing options for grass-fed beef Corey loves being a part of the rural community, spending time on the ranch with David and their three children, as well as in Portland with the chefs and buyers that are committed to supporting them, some of which are in the audience. Next we have Allison Hensey. Allison joined Oregon Environmental Council as its program director for Healthy Food and Farms in May 2006. Her focus is supporting the environmental stewardship and economic vitality of Oregon's farmers and ranchers and food businesses. Her work includes leading demonstration projects for sustainable farming and business practices, advocating for public policy that supports sustainable farming, and providing information and resources for farmers to engage in new markets and incentives that reward agriculturalists for their environmental stewardship. Prior to joining the Oregon Environmental Council, Allison served as a policy specialist in the director's office of the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, providing funding and support to our agricultural producers, forest land owners, and others for watershed uh, restoration, oh, wow. both salmon recovery projects. Oh, Allison received her <laughs> BA from Claremont McKenna College and her JD from the University of Oregon before joining the watershed uh, uh, board. She practiced land use law in Portland. And Emily. Emily Hall is the marketing associate for Stallbush Island Farms, the first farm to be certified sustainable by the Food Alliance and home to the first of its kind biogas plant in North America. 
Emily works on marketing, social media, and outreach programs for the farm. She previously worked for Net Green News and served as the senior executive producer for the Americas. Emily also worked for the United Nations Development Programs in Poverty and Gender Affairs in Panama City. After her post at the United Nations, Emily remained in Panama to produce an environmental television show that aired on E! Entertainment Television throughout all of Latin America. She grew up spending weekends at her family's ranch in Florida and developed a lifelong love for wildlife, the environment, and preservation of our natural world. Before I turn it over to them, will you give me, uh, uh, join me in giving uh, a round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> <laughs> so, Allison, I wonder if I could have you go first and just share some about uh, the agricultural work that you and OEC do, and especially any, um, especially innovative uh, agricultural practices you're involved in or, or seeing uh, being adopted as a part of your work. Hmm. Sure. Do you want me to come up there or just stay here at the table? If you need to. Yeah. If you need to. Okay. All right. <laughs> So thanks everybody for being here tonight. Um, I guess I just wanted to start by reflecting on the fact that Ray Bradbury died today. And um, he was one of my favorite authors growing up. And my favorite story of his was called The Toynbee Convector, um, which was really about the power of the belief that we can change the future uh, in actually letting us go ahead and do so. Um, it's a story about a man who tells society that he's traveled into the future and that he's seen that 30 years hence people have solved our environmental problems, our health problems, our equity problems, our economic problems and he tells them how they've done it and then society believing him goes forth and does so and he makes it up but that really doesn't matter because if people believe that they could, they could. And so I'm really honored to be speaking tonight with, with two people who are actually doing it, going ahead and making a new sustainable future and actually doing farming 2.0 or, or 3.0 um, because that's probably the most important thing for us to, uh, to do moving forward because that shows everybody else that it's possible and makes us believe that it's possible. So a lot of my work has to do with that too. We do a lot of demonstration projects with uh, farmers and agricultural industry sectors in testing out on the ground uh, practices that are going to be more protective of our health and the environment and actually enable farmers to make a good living at the same time and seeing what works and what doesn't and then having that uh, inform the policy work that we do trying to pass policy that supports farmers who want to adopt practices that protect our health and the environment. So we've worked with cranberry growers to uh, do on-farm research to use organic fertilizer and uh, less impactful pesticides and protect local salmon habitat and then develop a marketing collaborative um, based on their sustainable practices and the fact that they're from this region and connected them with buyers who in most cases paid them a higher price um, for that product um, because one of the most important things uh, is making the business case for sustainability. Uh, farmers are business people, food businesses are businesses and if it doesn't make business sense, then we won't be able to create a more sustainable food system. Um, we also have done projects with the winery industry and the nursery industry on climate friendly practices. So uh, actually just this spring, we helped launch the first uh, winery climate certification in the country. Um, we have 20 wineries now here in the Northwest that are, have committed to become carbon neutral and have gotten there through a combination of reducing their climate impacts and through offsets. And that's now a part of a certification label that the Oregon Wine Board has for sustainable grown wine here in the Northwest. Um, we've also worked with the nursery industry to develop best practices that let them use fertilizer more efficiently, energy more efficiently, water more efficiently in ways that also save them money, which is really important because the nursery industry has seen about a 40% hit in their bottom line over the last couple of years. Um, so, so those are the kinds of things we do on the ground to try and show the change that's possible um, in the world and to, to create a more sustainable food and farm system. And then we also advocate for more funding for our College of Agricultural Sciences to do the kind of research and outreach um, 
to help farmers be more innovative and more efficient so that they can protect our health and the environment and also uh, save costs and, and be sustainable economically. Um, we support more money for our Department of Agriculture so that they have marketing staff to help uh, farmers who grow sustainably sell their products so that it makes sense for the bottom line. And then we also try and uh, support policy that protects our environmental resources and our health as a bottom line, but finds innovative ways uh, to make sure that farmers are paid for the ecosystem services that they're providing. So that's just a little bit of a summary of the kinds of things that we do. Yeah. Um, now I feel like <laughs> you guys do a lot. <laughs> we try to um, do an excellent job of raising our cattle exclusively on pasture. We um, are working with a couple of other ranchers that share our values about how livestock can be raised. There's our ranch. <laughs> um, and most importantly, we're working with consumers and buyers, mostly in Portland, that believe in what we're trying to do. And um, we have two different channels that we sell our meat through. One is to consumers for their home freezers, and they actually buy a share of a cow while it's still alive, and they have control in how it's processed. And then that becomes their, usually their annual supply for beef. Um, we've actually started doing it with pork as well, and we provide some of our cow share members with eggs. And so that's a great thing. Um, we're probably not going to change how livestock are raised by selling quarters of cows, but for the people that have the freezer space and that are committed to doing it, it's really a phenomenal partnership that has allowed us to grow. And so the growth that we've experienced has been working with um, our wholesale market, and those animals are shipped to a USDA plant and processed and then distributed throughout Portland to um, universities, hospitals, and local restaurants. I seem to be the only one that needs a cheat sheet, but... <laughs> All right, so I'm from Stalbush Island Farms, and for those of you that don't know who we are, uh, we're in Corvallis, Oregon, and we were founded in 1985 by husband and wife, Bill and Carla Chambers, and we are a family farm still. They still live and work there. And we started with two crops and as an ingredient supplier for industrial manufacturers. And uh, that actually still accounts for 75% of our business. Um, since that day, we moved into the retail line, so we also have frozen fruits, vegetables, grains, and legumes, and we also have a farmer's market line that has vegetable purees and a pet food supplement line that is also the same vegetable purees. Um, we also have food service. We export to 25 different countries, and we still supply ingredients to 300 other companies. So we're the pumpkin and Mrs. Smith's pies. We farm 5,000 acres. It's a really large agricultural operation. And since day one, sustainability has always been one of our main focuses. So in 1997, we were the first farm ever to be certified sustainable by the Food Alliance. And that is a really comprehensive audit of the entire farming practice. So it looks at things, not only your input uses, but also your wildlife habitat, and your water quality, and your soil quality, and your treatment of your employees. So it's a huge certification, as I'm sure you've also been through the Food Alliance. It is um, really, really powerful, and we're really proud of it. And then in 2003, we got our first organic certification, and then in 2009, we um, declared energy independence with our first of its kind biogas plant in North America. So we take all of our agricultural waste and we create green energy with methane gas and we also create heat that we use to dry our seeds with and um, we also have hot air that we use to blanch our vegetables with. So we use a lot of, it's a closed loop cycle. 
it's really been amazing. And it also produces fertilizer that we spread back out into the fields and it's really made everything grow huge. It's amazing. So then in 2010, we also um, came up with the first of its kind biodegradable bag in the freezer section that we're aware of. Um, that was huge because we wanted our packaging to reflect our company. And then last year, we came out with a BPA-free liner, which is now standard for all of our cans. So I guess what I'm really trying to say here is that uh, sustainability is a lifestyle. It's a journey. You're always thinking about how you make your product better and how you become better, too, in your farming practices. And it's something that we really hold core in Salbush Island Farms. And we teach our employees from day one so that they know exactly what sustainability is. All right. Next one. <laughs> I hadn't heard that Ray Bradbury had died today. I'm just going to try and hold it together. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, now that I've, I've just been reflecting on it, that uh, dandelion wine is probably one of the earliest childhood exposures I would have had to what uh, truly local food uh, means or sounds like or kind of connotates. Allison, I'll start with a question uh, uh, for you and then we can move it around the table. There's a lot of talk and action in our region related to sustainable food systems and uh, rural producer and urban buyer connections. From your perspective, within everything that's happening here, what do you see is really working? Mm. Wow, and I would actually defer to, my, to <laughs> Emily and Corey on that because they're, they're living what's working. Um, but I think there are some really obvious examples of success, and then there are still some really big challenges. To me, the obvious, oh, I guess I just hit the volume button, sorry. <laughs> the obvious uh, examples of success are the incredible growth in um, farmer to eater sales through our farmers markets and through community supported agriculture, and then just one step further through all of our great restaurants and grocery stores here in, in Oregon that tell you where and how your food was grown so that you have a, a better understanding of the choices you have and you can make sustainable choices. Um, so I think that is a huge success here in Oregon, even though it's still a relatively small percentage of the food we eat. Um, and, and then I think in terms of the actual production side, some of the things that Emily and Corey do are incredible successes, even though they make it sound easy and I'm fairly certain it's not. <laughs> and that's things like you know, grass-fed beef, that's done in a way that protects uh, our habitat and our water systems and is healthier for the people who eat it and keeps you know, local dollars in the local community. Or the, the really innovative things that Stablish Island Farms is doing with closing the nutrient loop, which is one of our, the biggest challenges in farming here, uh, actually in the world, as well as here in the Northwest. Um, and then also the food packaging issue. So I know that we're working with Stalbush Island Farms on what will be a, the first um, BPA-free label for packaged food, which will be really exciting. And, and again, you guys are showing that it's possible and that it can make <laughs> business sense. Um, so those are some of the things that I think are working. Um, I think some of the challenges we still have are um, that we don't have the infrastructure in place to make it easy for people to know you know, where, where their food was grown and how it was grown and who grew it. Grew it. Um, and, it and our system doesn't internalize all of the true costs of food so that it doesn't still always make business sense to provide sustainable food to eaters. And until we can do that, um, that's going to continue to be a big challenge. Um, how about for you, Corey, within uh, urban-rural connections, what do you see is practically helping uh, you and your ranch move forward uh, toward building the connections you need to be uh, uh, not only uh, an environmentally sustainable business, but a financially sustainable business? You know, I think all of our, um, all of the market that we have built has been driven by consumers. And it started out with the cow share consumers who um, were committed enough to having sustainable grass-fed meat that they were willing to buy a quarter of a cow or a half a cow. And um, that's continued with our wholesale business. And so any deficiencies in our supply chain in terms of getting meat to the people that want it have largely been overcome by the fact that there are people and institutions out there. And um, 
the other challenge that we have is that people don't necessarily understand the difference in what we're doing. And so there's, I mean, there's a, such a crowded marketplace and there's a lot of um, different messages coming to people about food that they're completely bombarded with. And so for us to be able to present to people, why is what we're doing different? What is the value in it? And you know, why should you purchase it other than you know, that it tastes good? Um, so we've had a lot of help from our buyers in getting that message out to people. And um, like, for instance, Richard Santic is here from Dick's Kitchen, and that's a perfect concrete example of a buyer that is committed to our product, that we have um, continual conversations with, and who is really doing the groundwork for us about, you know, in educating the public about why this is important, what it does for your health, and why it's different. And so those type of relationships have been critical um, to us in growing. And so Emily, I'm curious with you, <laughs> not every farm uh, is large enough to have dedicated uh, marketing or outreach staff. So I'm curious from what Corey is saying, uh, for you, what are you learning about uh, the power of the touch points you do have to uh, build connections and share messages with consumers? Well, that's a good question. I actually really agree with what Corey was saying. That was my answer almost exactly. Um, so for us, you don't, if you don't have the do advertising dollars, then your number one way of reaching your consumer is your packaging. You have to put a really attractive package together um, that has color, consumers really respond to color, and also has information to tell them about your farm. Um, education is really what this is all about. Um, you have to have a way of telling people how you're doing things differently, um, that your food is still safe, and really be able to explain the food safety and the economics of it. Um, as you were saying, business is so important here. You really have to make sure that there is the economic stability background to everything that you're doing sustainably. It has to make sense. Otherwise, it'll just not work out. So that's something that I think is really important. So, uh, building what you were just saying, uh, Corey, can you just go a little more in depth? If I went and visited your ranch today, what would I see uh, that you are doing differently? What are the most important things you would want us, if you were leading us on a tour, to, uh, to see or take away from a, a visit to your ranch? Um, so I think that the things that, the perspective that we try to have in our day-to-day -day operations is that first and foremost, we raise very healthy grasslands. And um, the health of our grasslands are going to be a reflection of the health of our animals, our long-term profitability, um, the wildlife habitat. So every decision that we make is based on evaluating what's going on on our ground. And so the first place that I would take you would be to our old farm fields that were continually farmed. You know, this is sort of like one generation to the next. And so in my, my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation, these old farm fields that were continually tilled each year, um, there's a lot of erosion. There was, um, it was always monocrops. There was a lot of um, chemical fertilizer and a lot of herbicide use. And those fields are now um, close to, they'll never be what they were before they were plowed, but they were close to um, their completely native species and, and it's, a work, you know, it's a work in progress, but um, we're starting to see upland birds that we have never seen on the ranch before. We're starting to see larger populations of um, both nesting ground birds and upland birds. Um, so that would, that's where we would start. <laughs> we're also really trying to think carefully about the, the chemicals that we use. And we want to keep our animals as healthy as possible and supplement them from a nutritional standpoint um, with vitamins and minerals that may be deficient in the soil. But ultimately, we want to treat the soil and figure out why those deficiencies are there. We want to have cattle that don't need parasiticides every year, instead cattle that are adapted to the environment. And so we've actually had a pretty significant turnover in our cow herd because we've started selecting not for animals that would perform well in the feedlot, which is a lot of what ranchers need to do to survive economically, but for cattle that perform well on the rangeland. Um, 
And the, probably the last thing that's our huge focus right now is um, historically we would take all of our valley ground, our irrigated meadows, and cut them and put the hay up in the barn and then bring the cows in during the winter and feed them that hay. And that requires a lot of diesel. And so we want to have cattle that can go out and harvest that forage themselves. And so figuring out how to do that, how to, to still meet their nutritional needs, but to make sure that they are walking around on forage, that there's still some nutrient cycling going on, even in our dormant season, is, is important to us. So. That sounds like you're doing a lot. And Allison, do you want to uh, build on that at all? Uh, how else do you see, or how else is um, Oregon Environmental Council specifically helping uh, farms and ranches build uh, environmental and sustainable programs into their, into their agricultural practices? I, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox in that regard, and, we, and there are several main strategies. Um, I think one is, is making sure that um, there's sort of a fair baseline for all farmers to have, uh, you know, to protect our water resources and our soil and our wildlife habitat so that... Um, what, is, what does that mean, having a fair baseline? Well, um, I, I don't want to list a you know a parade of horribles, but the number one toxic being found in our waters is pesticides. We have three groundwater management areas here in the state that aren't safe for drinking water because of nitrates, some of which come from fertilizers. Um, you know, all of our major rivers violate the Clean Water Act. Um, I mean, uh, you know, our, our soil depletion is a real worry if we want to um, both you know, have healthy food in the future and be able to farm productively in the future, and then also it's important for carbon sequestration. So, so we have issues that we really need to work on here in the state. And, um, you know, Stablish Island Farms and, and Carmen Ranch are, are leaders in, you know, farming in a way that protects our environment and our health. And um, so I feel like there needs to be a fair playing field so that everybody meets, you know, sort of a, a baseline of protecting our health and our water resources and our wildlife habitat so that when people go above and beyond, like these guys are, um, it's not as difficult a stretch to do that uh, and it's a, it's a fair economic playing field too. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so from that baseline, I'm wondering uh, two more uh, farming 2.0. I, I would love to have you describe the biodigester project yeah. uh, All right. that's going on at Selvish. <laughs> Yeah, so our biogas is really one of our shining beacons, I feel like, these mm -hmm. days. Um, everyone's really interested in it. And it's been really amazing for us. So we take things like, in corn, you only use 30% of it. You have husks, you have cobs, you have all these waste streams that were just kind of sitting in the fields and rotting. I mean, they weren't really doing anything. I mean, of course, we were composting, but the image, I think, is better if it's in the field. So we... Um, pulled all of this stuff together and we found this really great technology in Europe and we brought it over um, and built the first of its kind biogas plant to convert all of that waste that was basically going to a compost field and keep it on the farm so that we could lock in all the nutrition because there's still so much nutrition in that and um, be able to make methane. So what we do is we take all of that and then we kind of chop it down into what we call a soup. And um, then we took it into anaerobic conditions, and basically bacteria uh, under um, no oxygen are able to respirate methane, is essentially what they do, why they biodegrade your sludge. And um, that is where we get our electricity, and then from that, because we have to keep it so hot, we also have heat. So we use our heat to dry our seeds. And then we also have hot water that we use in the processing plant, and we also blanch our vegetables with. And then all the water that comes out of there, we scrub clean <laughs> for our water quality, which is not something that we have to do. It's something that we choose to do because uh, we think that's what you should do. There's no choice for us. So um, we do that, and then from this process, we are actually generating twice what we need in the farm. So it's completely 100% green energy. And um, we power, so to give you an idea, we power twice what we need or 11,000 homes a year. 
Um, so we consistently get about 25 to 30,000 kilowatt hours a day, which is huge. <laughs> but it is like a cow, basically. We call it the energy cow. It has to eat all the time. And it has to be in the right conditions. I mean, if it's really cold outside, uh, just like we wouldn't be as productive, it's not as productive. So you really have to treat it like a living animal. And that's something that we have been struggling to deal with, especially in the winter months, because you don't exactly have crops to feed it. So we've had to do a lot of fun pickling projects for some of our alfalfa. Um, and then from this biogas plant, we also have this amazing fertilizer. And it's a rich, wet, and dry fertilizer that we spread back into the fields, which has really eliminated a lot of our need for other outside chemicals. And it's also made everything grow huge and bright and green. If you guys came out to the farm right now, you'd be amazed because it's just, the colors are amazing. And in farming, we really are trying to show how beauty and harvest really can go hand in hand. And that's something that a lot of people don't remember. <laughs> so that's my... Corey, what's the biggest challenge you're grappling with on your farm right now, your ranch right now, and what are you learning about uh, possible solutions? Um, our challenge has, al has almost always been the supply chain um, and figuring out how to do what we do well on the ground and get that product to the customer that wants it is, it never seems to get any easier. And um, I think that I, in the beginning, I felt like efficiency was going to be the solution to, um, to partner with um, distributors and processing facilities that could do it for, could do the processing and a distribution for a really low cost because that would allow us to compete in the marketplace from a price standpoint. But what I am starting to think and um, I've started to have conversations with people about is that what we really need in food is um, a different type of distribution system a uh, mid-scale, uh, not the super small, I mean, that's great, we've done that with farmers markets, but I think the um, large broadline distributors of the world are probably not adaptable enough to the realities of sustainable agriculture that they are going to be able, you know, their, their business systems are in place and um, I think that there is room and that we're moving towards um, sort of mid-scale regional production systems, distribution systems. People have referred to them as food hubs. I don't think any of us really know 100% how that's going to look in the future, but I think that that is the direction that we're moving, and I think that those of us who are trying to live in that world of um, a moderate scale, a regional production system, um, are going to keep beating our heads up against the wall until we figure it out. How about for you, Allison, within your scope of work? What are, what's the biggest challenge that you're up against right now? And uh, what hints of solutions might be presenting themselves? Um, I think, I think uh, Corey's right on, actually, about um, needing to have a different kind of organization that provides distribution through the value chain, um, and that, where that's part of their mission, so that they really want to make that succeed. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I actually also see, I mean, so you guys are making it up as you go along. And any, any other farmer or food business who wants to not just drop off a load at, at uh, you know, the commodity distributor, but, but wants to sell into a market or to eaters who care about where and how their food was grown, um, they each have to make it up. Because if you had been selling into the commodity market, it's a whole different skill set to create a business where you're able to tell your story and have a brand and do the marketing and the packaging and you know work your way through the distribution system. And so I think there's a real need for technical assistance and um, education and even business, you know, sort of low-cost business consultants to help, help people who want to create um, value-based food and farm businesses to, to do so and to do so successfully. Um, it still requires an entrepreneur, but um, I, I certainly know when people go looking for that kind of help, 
it's really not out there. And we're talking about remaking the kind of business models we have in the food and farm system. If you had one of those low-cost consultants, what would, what would Selvish be working on? What's the biggest challenge you're facing right now? <laughs> so my answer is actually different from yours. Um, I do have, education is obviously paramount. Um, that's always gonna be one of our biggest challenges for when we're talking about sustainability, because a lot of people just still don't understand what it means. Um, and I think that's because it's a broad term. You use it all the time these days. Um, but really for us, it's knowing your consumer. That is really important when you're trying to think about um, entering new markets and finding new outlets for your, your brand and your product. For we, so for us, our consumer is the natural products consumer. So um, the people that already know a little bit about sustainability and their food and want it grown in the USA and um, really care about the brand values that are behind it. So we don't really go after the really large um, chains because that's not, the profits aren't there and that's not really our model. So for us, we really spend a lot of time trying to educate ourselves on the consumer and who we're really targeting. Um, and I think we've had a lot of success in that. And that would be the, still the biggest challenge. <laughs> I'm really curious about the role that food uniquely can play in uh, helping to close urban-rural divides and to make urban-rural connections. Does anyone want to share any uh, thoughts or insights on that topic? I'm kind of looking at you first, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, food is the ultimate uh, connector of people in urban and, urban and rural areas. Um, uh, you know, rural areas provide urbanites sustenance for life, and urbanites provide a market and a living for people who grow food, and that's that's a pretty fundamental connection. Um, and I think food is a con is a an important connector in, between rural and urban areas as well, because um, so many things about food are connected to our ultimate well-being as well. So the kind of food we eat, you know, determines our health. Um, it also the how the food is grown and where it's grown determines what our environment looks like and whether it's a healthy environment, um, where our food is grown and whether we pay a fair price for it determines what kind of an economy we have. Agriculture and food is a huge part of Oregon's economy. Um, and so it connects us in terms of our shared well-being as citizens of Oregon as well. So, and I think the more that we can daylight that and um, Talk, have a conversation about our shared responsibility as citizens to support a food system that supports our well-being, then I think the better off we're going to be because we're still not there yet. We're starting to be there in what are still fairly growing niche markets, but still niche markets. But um, to the extent that we recognize that we're all responsible for making sure that sustainable food um, has to make business sense if we want it to succeed in the future, and that that's up to us, as well as farmers and food businesses, to make that work, the better off we're gonna be. And, you know, we're really lucky. We've begun those conversations in this country. Over the last seven or eight years, um, there's never been as high an awareness of uh, how our food's grown and where it's grown since the majority of people, you know, lived on farms or had a relative who farmed. So that's really great. We're in a, a great time for this conversation to go to the next level. But until we um, commit even further to making it work for everybody, um, I don't think we're going to get there. How about for you, Emily? What do you see the unique opportunity is for food? I would say patient education and remembering that you're converting one consumer at a time. Mm -hmm. So I would say really it's trying to have a solid base and understanding when people call in or talk to you or want to know more about who, you're, who you are and what you're doing. So for, for us, it's really about being passionate about what we're doing and actually living the lifestyle. So that's something that we look for in employees um, and people that are working for us because we really expect everyone to be kind of our ambassadors and everyone that calls in is also an opportunity to educate them about sustainability and about food and as you were saying, your well-being and it, it has, I mean, it's all connected. And food itself, I mean, everybody's eating. So food is the great connector between every, all of this. How about from your perspective, Corey? How can food play uh, a unique role in 
bridging urban and rural uh, communities? Um, I think just in my own personal situation, it, there is a huge quality of life aspect on both sides. So, um, um, you know, growing up on the ranch, we interacted with a lot of other ranchers, which was great. And there were a lot of other ranchers, and there, there aren't as many ranchers now. And um, I think that for me personally, to be able to come back and have a business where I interacted with people in Portland and people that were doing things um, that are way more diverse than just being livestock producers has been a huge part of the reason that I love my job. And, I, and we're able to live out in the you know, isolated corner of Oregon. And I think that to some degree we're able to offer that same thing to our buyers, whether they're um, big wholesale buyers or they're sharing a quarter of a cow with you know, six people on their block and I can still sit down. You know, I have a personal relationships with a lot of our customers. Our customers have, some of them have bought beef from us for, you know, close to a decade. And, you know, we see each other's kids grow up. And so I think that that's usually, it, there was a time when living in a rural community and producing food was a very isolating thing to do. And it meant that you just interacted with the people in your community and that's no longer the case. And I think that goes both ways. And it's, it's really fun. I'd like to invite audience members, if you'd like to ask questions, there's a microphone in the middle of the room, so uh, please don't be shy. We've got uh, time for some more healthy dialogue. Allison, I wondered, uh, we've got two great ranch and farm examples here. Is there another example you'd like to uh, share, just another uh, farm you could bring to life for us that you've been working with closely? Gosh, um, <laughs> there's so many. I mean, we're really lucky here in Oregon. We have so many leaders in this movement. Um, the first, actually, co-op that springs to mind is Norpac, actually, which is a cooperative of, a, gosh, over 130 different vegetable growers who grow for processed vegetable markets. Um, so if you go to, uh, you know, Costco and buy some green beans in the frozen section, you know, sometimes it might be theirs. And they're just working their way through Food Alliance certification, a sustainability certification. Um, and uh, because they believe it will give them a competitive advantage. So I think um, that's a really great story, but there are so many great stories. Um, we've been working to get funding for uh, local collaborative projects um, in, lo in local communities that help reduce pesticides that end up in water. And um, gosh, the, uh, the fruit growers in Hood River are one of the leaders in starting a pilot project that demonstrates that when they test what's in the water, then they can collaboratively figure out how to reduce what's ending up in the water in a way that um, you know, isn't onerous regulations and also saves the money because they're using less pesticides. So there are endless great examples. Turn it over to you if you could just share your name and any affiliation. Uh, Jim share. Kelly, Johnny Creek Ranch um, in the, uh, on the John Day River. Um, we also produce grass-fed beef, and I agree with everything you say, Corey. Um, and uh, we, we, uh, we also, we just, we're a very small operation, we sell direct, uh, so I know what you're talking about. And uh, our big challenges are, are also uh, in, in, the, in the marketing because we don't have the distribution system. Um, and you know, to give you a, an example, we have to use essentially a local butcher. Um, our cost is about $500 per animal for that, whereas you know, a factory done um, processed beef is about $75. Um, but my, my question for any of you, but particularly you, is any thoughts? One of the things, since uh, I've been out there for 13 years, but but come from the city, so I understand the market. I understand the Portlanders, and and uh, you know, my mother was cooking macrobiotically. I hate to say, 40 some years ago. Um, so I get that. My neighbors don't. Chambers, your family, um, you know, you guys are very exceptional at coming out of the ranching and farming world, but getting all of that and understanding the market. My neighbors don't. Um, I'm a tiny producer, they're very large. Ranchers and farmers are famous for being so insular, you know, they don't, they don't talk to each other a lot, 
and I watch my neighbors, you know, produce these beautiful animals, um, and then they get sold to this market where, you know, this beautiful animal that's been a totally natural, essentially, usually a very totally natural product, and then it goes to the commodity market, it goes into the feedlot, it gets fed that corn and antibiotics and the whole nine yards. Yet, my neighbors, when I talk to them about this, they don't have a clue about how much of a market there is out there. They, they, don't, they don't understand it. They have no motivation to do anything differently. And I think the thing that, that I haven't heard in this conversation is, is that side of it. How do we, you know, I understand the demand and, and the market, but how do we reach out to the farmers that aren't as forward thinking um, uh, as the chambers of the Carmen family? Corey, how do we reach out? Um, very, very slowly. <laughs> and, um, and I think you could say that on the, con I mean, I think the same thing's happening on the consumer. I mean, we're having a conversation about 1% of the population on both sides, on the production side and on the purchasing side. And little, I mean, but I think you're probably going to change those in different ways. Um, Emily's changing the, the consumer side by, through education. Um, I hope that we will, you know, that's probably what I'll spend the next 20 years working on, is first of all showing by example that, hey, this is how we figured out how to do it. This is how we were able to afford to hold our animals a little bit longer. This is how we can winter those two-year-olds through without it, you know, breaking us. Um, if you want to sell a couple of your animals to us and we'll run them through and see what they look like on the rail and we'll pay you top dollar if you're willing to, to do that for the extra effort and, you know, but you need to stop using conventional fertilizer on your ground, you know? And hey, look, we can show you, actually our yields came back in three years when we did it. Let's go look at our fields. You just start having these conversations and you say, we're gonna pay you for your time. We're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna get rich, but we're gonna offer you a consistent price. Um, and, and that's where these whole, this idea of these regional food systems come into play because it's crazy for all of these ranchers who are selling direct to be selling direct. And most ranchers don't want to. I mean, that's why you go into ranching. It's not because you have any desire to be out on the street selling your product. And I think that there's a lot of value in that. And hopefully we can create a food system that respects that desire and that lets ranchers be good at what they're doing, but also incentivizes them to change practices that have become ingrained out of habit rather than out of profitability or sustainability. Because it's not that, it's not that people don't want to make change, it's just that they're really risk averse and they have good reason to be. And so to remove some of that risk aversion and to show them on the ground what their neighbors have done little by little, um, I think, you know, people will follow. Hi, uh, my name is Eric Lambert from WSU Clark County Extension. And I think I heard uh, Corey mention uh, or be associated with uh, grass-fed uh, cooperative marketing. And I just wanted to know if you could tell me a little bit about uh, the role that played in your success and um, elaborate a little bit on the involvement of cooperative marketing or Allison, either one. Um, yeah, you guys could probably, our cooperative marketing is pretty um, informal at this point. Um, so I market <laughs> and I do a fairly mediocre job of it and I work with a couple other ranchers who have had that um, who are pretty committed to wanting to raise their animals exclusively on pasture and who are willing to get the Food Alliance certification. So we sort of created this standard and we keep having uh, these conversations like constantly it feels like about what we're doing, how we're going to make this work. Um, I think that hopefully in the future we'll have a couple more people involved but um, that's the extent of what we're doing. Anything you'd add to that, Emily? Well, um, I'd say that for us, we've really had a lot of success in selling the story. That's really, you have to, you have, to have a really good story to pitch to the consumer. Um, and, you know, our story is that we're a real family. They still work there every day. They live on the farm. Um, we have really great ethics, um, which can shine through in really everything that we do. 
Um, and we market that pretty exclusively, or pretty much regionally, because we're sold, um, our retail brands are sold all across the US and in Canada, and we don't really discriminate. We don't regionally specific um, advertise to different regions, we just advertise as a whole, and it's really always about the fact that we are different. Um, and that's really what we've done. I guess I'd just add one of the Working in the uh, supply chain and for sustainable restaurant industry uh, and for a, a medium-sized buyer of a company, the kind that uh, Corey's pointing to, we need more of uh, beyond uh, the small-scale uh, farmers markets and independent restaurants. Uh, I'll say one of my biggest challenge as the, the buyer in the equation was not only finding uh, large enough volumes of great seasonal produce, but finding farmers and ranchers that were willing to share their story. Uh, most farmers don't have the nerve that these uh, uh, ladies are, are demonstrating here. They don't want the, the media to show up on their farm and put cameras and microphones in their faces when uh, the berry harvest is right there. They're working. So that's a real dilemma. Uh, not every farm is big enough to have the, the marketing resources that a success story like Stallfishes does. So the farmer or rancher ends up wearing many, many hats, and some of them are not comfortable fits. <laughs> Allison, I would just add yeah. too that um, just as an outside observer in a couple efforts to set up small cooperatives, um, it's not easy. You, need, you actually need a charismatic leader who's entrepreneurial, who is good at marketing and selling, and who's willing to spend time doing that. And then you also have to have all of the, the, the organizational um, uh, sort of pieces in place that make any business successful. And so you have to have uh, the right skill sets, you have to have trust, you have to have everybody believing that working together is going to benefit them and, and willing to dedicate the time and resources to that up front because it's, it might not pay off for a while. So um, I guess I just wanted to point out that you, you don't just throw together a, you know, a cooperative effort and, and problem solved. Hi there, my name is Kevin Hershey. I'm in the um, MPA program, the Masters of Public Administration here at uh, Portland State. And um, towards the beginning, I think, Corey, I think you mentioned that um, um, becoming certified was a huge, was a big deal, and I'm sure it is. And I'm just wondering about that process. And is that process static? Is it evolving? Because um, obviously uh, not all farms are the same. You know, hopefully that process wouldn't be too much of a burden for the smaller farms. <laughs> I, I can jump on that one. Um, so what I like about the sustainability certification is that it really caters to the individual, which is something that um, organic doesn't quite do yet. Um, they're both amazing certifications and we have both, but sustainability is awesome because it can kind of look at exactly what your problems are. And then from there, they work with you to find out what makes sense business and economic wise, um, that's what happened with us. We were the first one certified sustainable, so we did have a little bit of leeway there. But um, that's what I think is so awesome about sustainability. It really caters to you and um, lets you do things that really work for you. And then also work for the environment and for your food. <laughs> More to add? Go ahead. My name is Patrick Shannon. I work at Sustainable Northwest. Um, so I have a question for Corey and Emily, and it kind of goes along actually with Jim's question. Um, so what were the factors that each family um, realized that they said, OK, I want to change my practices? Well, that's kind of the first question. And the second question is, what was the, I imagine there was pushback in the community when that actually happened, because it's stepping outside of tradition. So yeah, what were the factors that made the change, and then what was the pushback? Okay, well, for us, really, it was day one is what we decided. That's how we wanted to farm. Because we really believe that we want our farm to be there generations to come. And we want our families to be on that farm. And we want it to be profitable. And we want it to be healthy. And we want all of these things. 
So we were always sustainable. It was just a matter of getting the certification that made it us be able to say all of those things. Um, the pushback from the community, I'd say, it is kind of probably what you're grappling with today. It can be a little challenging, sure. But at the same time, once they see how amazing it, everything is going, then they usually come around. <laughs> and again, it's education-based. Um, a lot of it is really being patient about it and explaining why it is that you do the things that you do and how you do them. Um, and that usually stops the conversation. <laughs> and so you're asking, like on our ranch, when we started raising animals strictly on pasture, um, my uncle definitely didn't think it was going to work. <laughs> um, you know, within our own family, it was everybody has a different situation. So um, my uncle was the only one left. My uncle and my grandmother were the only ones left on the ranch, and they were struggling, and they were tired. And they thought, um, I was moving back from Los Angeles, so I had these great ideas about um, how much consumer demand there was for, for healthy, sustainable meat. And they thought I was nuts, but you know what? They didn't really have any other options, right? And they were. This was their. That ranch was both of their life's work. Um, their. They wanted more than anything to see that continue. And since I was the only one standing there, <laughs> they just went with it. Um, and the, when it came to um, the community. I mean, they still, I'm an outsider for sure. I'm not a complete outsider because I'm the fourth generation on that land, and so it's hard for people to, you know, so that's a great advantage for us. I mean, we didn't move here from some other state and decide we're going to go into ranching. Um, so I get a lot of, you know, well, everybody's different, or he sure is. <laughs> but even ranchers who don't get out much, you know, are starting to see, I mean, they see Time Magazine, they see um, what's on the national news, and there's mention of things like grass-fed beef, and so there's curiosity. But I think for us, when we started working with another family ranch in the valley, and they, um, basically, I grew up talking to them, um, asking them questions, and so when we started working with them, and they're a really well-respected ranch, and they are more traditional, um, they didn't go to, nobody in the family went to college in California, you know, so, so um, it's just, it's a really slow process. So the fact that the McLaren family is involved in what we do, and that we work together and we have a relationship, um, I think gives us a little more legitimacy. But ultimately, I mean, honestly, it doesn't matter that much. Um, you know, we're going to do what we do. We're going to work really hard to do the best job that we can. And our, you know, our doors are always open. I mean, anybody can walk up to anybody in the McLaren family and say, so what's this grass-fed deal you're doing? And how's that working out for you? And, you know, that's, that's how it has to work. You can't, the moment you start suggesting to somebody, I mean, even the other day we had some cattle come back onto the ranch that were raised by our neighbors. And I told my uncle, I'm like, call him and tell him to come look at these two-year-olds and tell him that if he wanted, you know, even three or four, if he just wanted to hold on to them for one more year, this is what we could pay him. And so it's just, you know, but that's a conversation that we waited five years to have with this one guy. It's just a long process. Yes, go ahead. Hi, I am a steed, a retired registered dietitian, and I'm so impressed with you people do, your dedication to sustainable food systems, and um, I, it's beyond my ability to compliment you enough, but what I want to say is the American Dietetic Association, who's now the Academy of Food and Nutrition, claims dietitians are the food and nutrition experts which really gets me because I know very few dietitians that know anything about ranching or really food growing production distribution. And I want to write something, hoping it'll get published. What would you say to such a claim, dietitians are the food and nutrition experts from your side? 
That's yeah. interesting. Um, I would say actually that it's a combination. I, I would say the dietitians have to work with someone like us to understand a little bit more about where their food's coming from. And we also need to work with them to understand what the nutrient values are for our food. You know, I think that that conversation is maybe the one that's lacking a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we could always all benefit from, especially on the nutrient side, knowing what you should be eating, what you should be telling your kids to eat. I mean, we all know that fruits and vegetables, including those are, are great, but actual the actual benefits of it and having a dietitian on staff would be Amazing. <laughs> okay, so you're looking at a good connection between. The I two I think two yes. Two. I think that has to happen. Right, 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 mm -hmm. right. Allison, where do you see new, uh, dietary nutrition expert expertise in the mix? Yeah, I agree with Emily. I think that's a really important connection to make. I mean, we haven't even started to talk about the other elephant in the room here, which is obesity. Yeah. Um, or some of the the diseases that uh, more and more scientists are saying might be caused by what's in our food. Um, so I think making those connections is gonna be really important for people to get a better picture of what kind of food they, sh they want to eat in the future for their well-being. Because currently there's more problems than we have solutions for, so there's still quite a bit of work to do. Of be a good partnership. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you also for all of your kind words. I have one more quick question for each of you and then we'll close. I'll start with uh, you, Allison, and then Emily and Corey. What are you looking forward to? Dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh gosh. You know, we were talking, here we are talking about urban rural connections and um, I think the thing that gets me most excited and sustains me in this work are the human connections that, um, that we've already made in trying to build a more sustainable food and farm system between grower and eater and you know, the different folks working on these issues. But that's something I really look forward to is, um, is building more connections with people who want to create a better food and farm system. So an example would be working with the nutrition or, or uh, industry or with dietitians. Yeah. But it's, um, it's that, that human connection um, that gets me up in the morning and gets me excited. Yeah. Emily, what are you looking forward to? Me. Um, well, I actually really love, we, you were touched on childhood obesity, and mm -hmm. I, that's one of the main issues that we're trying to help in Stalbush Island Charlotte Farms. We donate lots of money and time, and um, we just donated for Corvallis in general, we donate to the Corval Edible Corvallis, and it does tasting tables throughout all of the 11 elementary schools there. And going to these cute little elementary schools and seeing kids like really excited about green peas <laughs> is really fun. <laughs> so for me, I think always, of course, the human interaction is so fun, and getting people really excited about food. I mean, I get to talk about food all day long. <laughs> Who doesn't like that? <laughs> and then I get to eat it too, it's just fun. So for, for me, that's really what is really fun and that's what I look forward to every day. But um, for Oregon in general, um, I think that we have an enormous potential to really become a leader in sustainability. We have like a perfect storm of amazing um, elements. I mean, you have amazing soil quality here that you really don't see anywhere else. And we can grow crazy amounts of varieties of food um, that the Midwest probably doesn't, can't do. And we also have these natural predators that help with pests. And we have our great water quality. And then also the Oregonians in general. I mean, their whole mentality of how they view things and how progressive they are in wanting um, sustainable food, it just makes us, it makes us a leader in sustainability. And we should definitely capitalize on that. And I think that's maybe our biggest challenge going forward, <laughs> moving forward with that. Corey, what are you looking forward to? I look forward to um, a day in the not too distant future where we have significantly more options for types of foods in the marketplace and we have, um, and, and we go back to our rural communities and they are much more vibrant um, because of that. Will you please join me again in thanking Corey Carmen from Carmen Ranch, Allison Hensey from Oregon Environmental Council, and Emily Hall from Salbush Island Farms.
and but I won't stand between you and your pizza. But uh, one something I should have said up front too is that in addition to thanking the Sustainable Northwest, Patrick, Renee, Martin, Chad, all the other folks there who helped, I really wanted to thank uh, the staff of ISS who have really pulled this together um, with Sustainable Northwest this year, Jenny Duvander, Laura Lime, Shpressa Halimi, uh, um, Camille Almer, uh, who's been tweeting this whole time. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, thank you for the wonderful work you put in to put this, help put this uh, lecture series together. So please give them a round of applause.